Hi. So in the last video, we sort of introduced the intuition behind Snell's law, and we didn't really get into the derivation of how exactly we, we come up with that with the law. So here, what I'd like to do is give um, an explanation just using geometry and just using the idea that light slows down when it's going through a um, medium of high refractive index. Um, just really based on just those two things, where we can find it pretty easy. So um, let's say we got this interface here. And let's say that I've got N1 on the top, and we're just going to say this is like air. So this is going to be equal to 1. And let's say we've got N2 on the bottom. And let's just say that's equal to 2 to make things pretty easy here. And say we've got an incident ray that's coming in through the air at, say, this angle like this. And then it refracts because it's going through a medium of different refractive index. So it's going to go say down in this direction approximately and if you recall how this works let me just bring up this little demo really quick this was a uh, finite difference time domain method so we're seeing these plane waves are coming in and they're going to hit this interface and you'll see we'll see why they curve and kind of remind ourselves of, of um, what ha what's happening here So just to um, sort of remind you how this process works is that wet wave's coming in, this plane wave, and then when it hits it, this side slows down a little bit. And this side slows down, but this other side keeps going the same speed. So when that happens, it, it tilts the wave, and that's why we get this, um, this sort of a curve. Um, but let's get into the math of just a little bit of geometry is all it takes to show um, why that's the case. And it's going to help us a little bit if we um, just add another ray here. It's kind of hard just to see based on one ray, but let's go ahead and add another one. I think that's going to help us figure this out. So say it's going this parallel to this other ray like this. Maybe let's extend this one a little bit out. And what I'd like to do is sort of imagine, like we saw those wave fronts with that FDTD um, simulation where, you know, you have like the blue and the red. And let's just say we're looking at sort of those blues, and each of those blues is like a peak of the of the wavelength where you know everything's in phase along that phase front. So let's just say this is like one of those peaks of say it's blue along this line here. And let's just say that this is our wavelength all the way here. So we'd have another peak um, right up here. And another peak would be up here, which we won't be able to see the full thing. Um, but as you know, when it hits this, it's going to slow down when it hits this medium. So if we took this wavelength here and kind of thought of it down here, well, you know, that might get us to right here. But it's going to actually have two full periods between this. So it's going to have another wavelength peak here. And of course, what happens here is that these wave fronts have to, have to connect because this, this was one wave front. So this, this peak here is going to connect to the peak that we had at this interface here. And then, you know, we have, at this point, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be slowed down. So we'd have another um, peak right here. And you can connect these and imagine, you know, this is another wave front. It's just now it's going to be a little bit tighter. OK, so this is pretty much um, all that we need because we got this. The nice thing about setting up like this is we have this shared um, sort of a diagonal here that we can, that we can um, connect the top and the bottom with. And before we go ahead and do that, let's just kind of notate what some of these angles would be. So let's just say this is our theta 2 prime. This isn't really our, um, it's not the theta 2 we want to end up with, but it's pretty, it, it's going to help us get there. And let's say this one on the top is, call this um, theta 1 prime. So not the ultimate theta that we're looking for, but it's going to help us get there. So theta 1 prime. Um, and now we also actually know these distance, this distance here. We know that this was actually, um, if I, it's getting a little crowded here, but let's call this lambda 1. And we actually know that our lambda 1 is going to be uh, lambda naught divided by n1. And we said n1 was, um, was, was just n of air, so that's just, that's just going to be um, lambda naught. And lambda 2 down here, we could denote it as such. Well, we know that lambda 2 is going to be lambda naught divided by n2. So we actually know what these distances are because we know what n is. And what else do we need? Well, that's pretty much all we need to start, just start some equations here because we can find this hypotenuse based on both of these, the information we have on both sides here. So let's just start on this. Um, this side here, so we've got 
um, theta 2 and we've got lambda 2. So we can actually find this here. And let's, let's denote this as, um, let's call that D. Things are getting a little bit crowded here, but just bear with me. Hopefully you can track all this notation on here. We'll call that D. And we know that sine of theta 2 is going to be equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse here. That's because that's what, that's what sine is, right? Opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of theta 2 is going to be equal to lambda 2 divided by d. OK, so we got an equation on this side. Now let's go ahead and try and get an equation for up here. Um, just following the same logic here, we could say that our sine of theta 1 prime is going to be equal to our opposite, which is lambda 1 divided by our hypotenuse, which we share with the other side, which is d. So you see, now we've got both of these in terms of d, and we can just solve for one and plug, and plug it into the other one. So let's go ahead and just solve for, say, this one on the bottom here. Let me add this prime up here, which I forgot. And let's say that our d is equal to lambda 2 divided by sine of theta 2 prime. OK, so all we got to do is take this and plug it in up here for this d. So let's just go ahead and do that over here on the side, because now we're getting pretty close here. So we say um, sine of theta 1 prime is equal to lambda 1 divided by our d, which is down here. So this would be um, lambda 2 over sine of theta 2. OK. So now we can just start manipulating this. And let's say we want to get that lambda 2 over here and bring that sine of theta 2 up here. So we could say that um, lambda 2 times sine of theta 1 prime is equal to lambda 1 times our sine of theta 2. OK, now this is looking pretty close to Snell's law, right? Um, but we, we, don't ha we want this in terms of n's, but we already got our, our lambdas in terms of n up here. So let's go ahead and plug these in. So for lambda 2, we'll plug in lambda naught over n2. And for lambda 1, we'll plug in uh, lambda naught over n1. And of course, these uh, lambda naughts are going to cancel out here. And we're going to be left with something that's basically Snell's law. So it's going to be n1 sine of theta 1 prime is equal to n2 sine of theta 2 prime. So the only thing we're left with here that um, may not be exactly clear is this theta 1 prime and the theta the 2. We got the primes on the end because we wanted to find theta 1 as this angle here, actually. This is the theta 1 we're looking for. But we know that if we take theta 1 and add it to this um, theta angle over here, let's call this A, angle A, we know that um, theta 1 plus A is equal to 90. And we could do the same thing over here. We could say theta 1 prime plus A is also equal to 90 um, based on this um, 90 degree angle here. So we know that um, theta 1 is actually equal to theta 1 prime. And this is the ultimate theta 1 we're looking for. And I could say the same thing down here for this um, theta 2 that we're actually looking for. It's actually going to equal, theta 2 is actually going to equal theta 2 prime. So what I can do is go ahead over here and take off these little primes. And we are left with Snell's law. So that is how you derive Snell's law. So hopefully this makes sense. And hopefully that wasn't too bad. Really, all we needed to know was basically that you know these wavelengths are going to change um, proportionally, inversely proportionally to that index of refraction, because that speed slows down. We just know that. And we know just a little bit of geometry. And it's not too bad. So hopefully it was helpful. And until next time, take care.